So in a previous lecture, we introduced the concept of specific heat. How does one measure the specific heat of an unknown material? Well, one common technique is called calorimetry. And what happens here is that we have a bunch of substances of given mass, and they can start with different initial temperatures. And when we mix them together, we put them in thermal contact, but we seal off these with the, from the environment, which means we do not allow anything to exchange energy with the environment. They start off at different temperature, but eventually through heat exchange, they reach the same final temperature, right? And then we can use the conservation of energy of the substance in, in the sealed system to find the uh, specific heat of its unknown material. In this illustration that you see here, suppose we have two substances, one and two, initially at higher temperature, and then two other substances, three and four, initially at a lower temperature. Now we mix them together, then clearly, um, due to heat exchange, objects one and two will give up heat, and object three and four will, re will receive heat. And the conservation of energy requires that the amount of heat given up by one and two will be equal to the amount of energy um, that's absorbed by three and four, right? And so how much energy is, is um, how much total heat is um, absorbed? We call it Q cold because the cold substance will receive heat, okay? And how much heat is, um, is lost by the, uh, by the high temperature substance? That's, that's Q hot, okay? Now we define Q as the amount of heat received by the system, okay? So when Q is positive, that means the system receives heat. When Q is negative, it loses heat. And since the hot sub substance actually give up or, or lose heat, Q is negative for the hot, su hot, hot substance and positive for the cold substance. So they're not equal, Q cold and Q hot, rather they differ by a negative sign, right? Because Q hot is negative, with a negative sign becomes positive. So when a cold substance, substance uh, uh, let's say they, they gain a total of uh, 10 calories from the hot substance, that means the hot substance will, will lose 10 calories. And that's how the two sides are equal if you attach this negative sign, okay? So that's the basic idea. Now, how much energy um, is, how much heat is released by uh, the cold substance? What is the, uh, by, by the hot substance, what is the actual expression? Well, we know Q equals to mass of the substance times specific heat times the temperature change uh, of T final minus T initial, right? T final minus T initial. Now, this is positive if T final is greater than T initial, when T final is greater than T initial, which means uh, it, uh, it's, it's a colder substance which absorbs heat and it's negative if T final is less than T initial, okay? That's when hot substance, substance give up heat, all right? So you see Q can be positive and negative, but when you attach a negative sign to the heat released, um, it becomes positive again. Okay, so in our case, uh, what we have here, is objects, objects one and two giving up heat and object three and four receiving heat. So what is the amount of heat received by object number three? That will be mass of object three, C3 uh, times the final temperature minus T3 initial, right? T final is greater than T3 initial. And then also what is the heat uh, absorbed by object number four? That'd be similarly M4, C4, T final, minus T4 initial. You know the T4 initial may not necessarily be equal to T3 initial, but they must have the same final temperature. That's when thermal equilibrium has been reached. Okay, now what is that equal to? That equals the amount of heat um, given up by objects one and two. Okay, how much heat is given up by object one? Well, um, the, the amount of heat it receives would be, would be M1, C1, T final, minus T1 initial, right? But since the heat is lost, T final is less than T1 initial, this, this whole thing uh, on the right-hand side is negative. So I have to attach a negative sign to bring back to positive, right? Similarly, the amount of heat lost by object number two would be minus M2, C2, T final, minus T2 initial, right? Now you'll notice that if I move 
both terms on the right-hand side, which carry a negative sign for each, to the left-hand side, then the negative signs would disappear and every term will have T final minus T initial of that substance. Okay, so that's the same as uh, M C T final minus T uh, N initial. N is the uh, N's index, like in this case, one, two, three, and four. And this is the N's object, uh, substance in the mix. This is the specific heat of the N substance. Um, if basically I have moved everything to the right hand side, or to the left hand side, and if I add everything, in this case, N goes from one to four, and that would be equal to what? That would be equal to zero, right? Now, if you know everything else except the specific of one of these four substances, then you can find that, okay, by, from this equation. So that is how we do calorimetry, okay? With example of four substances, you can have any number that you want. I'm assuming at this point that there is no phase change, okay? There is no latent heat involved. The only heat exchange is, is being used to increase or decrease the temperature of the substance. Okay, again, the principle is the conservation of energy because there's no heat, there's no energy lost um, to the environment or nor does it gain any extra energy from the environment. Uh, heat is only being exchanged in between different parts of the same system. That's why we have this conservation of energy within the system. Now let's look at a actual example. Um, here is a typical setup of a color, calorimeter. Uh, remember, we, we need a sealed system. We need, to, we need a well-insulated system. Otherwise, the thing can exchange energy with the environment, and then you don't have this conservation of energy anymore. So here we have a styrofoam cup, okay? Styrofoam cup to, to minimize the energy lost or energy exchange with the environment. Then I have um, some water inside, right? And I have a thermometer to monitor the temperature variation. I have a stirrer whose function is to, e is to equalize the temperature throughout the, uh, the, uh, the water inside. Now, let's say we know the amount of water uh, that you have, initial temperature. And then let's say I have uh, you know, a metal block whose, whose um, uh, specific heat value I wish to measure. Okay, how would I do that? Well, I can take that block of, block of metal, right? I can drop it, you know, I drop it in there, okay? So let me... Um, let me drop it in there, okay? So this block, hold on. Got this block, I drop it in there. It's got a certain initial temperature, whatever that is. Let's say it's warm, it's, 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 it's warmer than the water. And then when you drop it in, um, it's gonna lose heat and the water is gonna absorb heat, eventually reach the same temperature. And then that's indicated by the thermometer, the reading will rise, right? If you measure the final temperature, and if you also know the initial temperatures of both the, the metal and the water, then from the uh, discussion that we saw above, uh, the amount of heat lost by the, by the metal block equals the amount of heat absorbed by the water. You set up this equation, you can find the specific heat of this block of metal. If you also consider uh, the, uh, the, the cup, the container as part of the system, which who's also, who also goes through temp same temperature change as water, sometimes that happens. Then you also have to add, consider the uh, heat that's being absorbed by the cup, not just the water, right? So that's the basic uh, setup for a typical calorimeter. Now, here is an actual example. Suppose we wish to find the specific heat of copper. How do we do that? So we have an aluminum cup of mass 25 grams, okay, which contains 50 grams of water. Initial temperature of both at 28 degrees Celsius. Okay. And uh, we keep them at the same temperature. Now, of course, we do insulate them from, from, from the surrounding, from, from the air uh, around it. Now, then we drop a hot cup of, hot block of copper at 95 degrees Celsius. And then we stir the, the water and eventually we, we, you know, we monitor the temperature through a thermometer. Eventually the thermometer stops climbing when it reaches 29.7 degrees Celsius. Okay, again, the system is sealed to prevent an energy exchange with the environment. Question is, based on these data, can you find the specific heat of copper? Okay, so in this case, I have two substances um, 
that will absorb heat. One is the water in the aluminum cup. The other is the aluminum cup itself, assuming they always keep the same temperature. Okay, and then we have one substance that loses heat and that is the copper block, of course. So how much heat is being, is being um, absorbed by the aluminum cup? Well, let's see here. The aluminum cup, again, we start with aluminum cup and its uh, mass is M1, this we call it M1. Okay, and it's got a specific heat of C aluminum, which we, we know, we, we, there is one thing we don't know, which is the uh, uh, specific heat of copper, okay? And the temperature change for the aluminum cup is uh, T final minus T initial, okay? T initial for the cup, right? So we call it T uh, one initial, one standing for aluminum. Is this whole expression positive and negative? Well, T final is higher than T1 initial because the aluminum cup received heat. So this is the positive term, right? And then don't forget the water in the cup also absorbs heat. So that is the mass of the water, we call it M2. And C water, which we know of course, and the temperature change of water, that's the same amount as the temperature change of the aluminum cup, the T final and T2 initial, Okay, T2 is the same, T2 initial is the same as T1 initial. Okay, T2 initial, okay. So heat exchange, uh, the heat absorbed by the aluminum cup plus the heat absorbed by the water, what is that equal to? That equals the heat lost by the copper block and that is negative times the mass of the copper block M3 C copper, which we wish to find out, and then T final minus T3 initial, which is the initial temperature of copper. Okay, now you don't, if you don't want that negative sign, you don't want that negative sign here, what you can do is you can move the whole, this entire term on the right hand side the equation to the left hand side, then you end up with every term uh, being the same, is always C times the mass times T final minus T initial, just like what you see here, okay? always T final ahead of T initial. Or alternatively, I can get rid of this negative sign by uh, writing the, 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 the two temperatures in the parentheses as T3 initial minus T final, because after all, T3 initial is higher than T final, right? And uh, then you don't have a negative sign anymore, either way. All right, now we have some numbers here. Uh, M1 equals to 25.0 grams. Right? And C aluminum, that's, that is known. And that is 0.215 calorie per gram per Celsius degree. I mean, you can also use joules if you want to, but um, here we use calories. Okay. And then T final equals to what? 29.7 degrees Celsius. Okay. T1 initial, initial temperature of the aluminum cup, and that is 28 degrees, right? 28.0 degrees. And then M2, that is the mass of the water, and that is uh, 50 grams, 50.0 grams. Okay, and uh, the final temperature of the water is the same as that of the aluminum cup and T2 initial is the same as that of T1 initial, that's over 20 degrees Kelvin, I mean 20 degrees Celsius. And uh, M3, that is the mass of the block of copper and that equals to, how much is that equal to? Uh, it is not given in this text here. So I have to tell you what that is, okay? It's 16 grams. Okay, I have to write it down here, 16 grams. Otherwise you cannot solve the problem, okay? And, and then T3 initial, that is the initial temperature of the, of the copper block and that's 95 degrees Celsius. Okay, you plug all these numbers in, now you know everything. The only thing you do not know is C of copper and you can easily solve it, right? So you plug in, you plug in numbers, you say, uh, 25 
times 0.215. times t final, which is 95, minus t1 initial, which is 28.0. Okay. Uh, actually, t final is not 95. t final is not 29.7. 29.7. Minus 28.0. And that's the term for the aluminum. And then you have the term for the for the heat absorbed by the water, which is 50 times what is what is the specific heat of water? It's one calorie per gram per degree Celsius. So it's one here. And then um, same temperature change 29.7 minus 28.0. And right, what is that equal to? It's right inside. Uh, negative mass of the block, 16, right? C copper, which is the only unknown wish to find, 95 minus initial, actually T final minus T initial. Uh, so it's T, T final, which is 27.9, 29.7 minus 95, okay? And then you can go ahead and solve for the specific heat of copper. So if you do the numbers correctly, you find the answer to be point zero, nine, two, three, actually to two six figures, point zero, nine, two, or to three six figures, point zero, nine, two, three. Calories per gram per Celsius degree. That is the answer. Okay, so that's an example involving three um, substances, the aluminum cup, the water, and the copper block. When you mix them together, which is the same final temperature, and from the conservation of energy, you can go ahead and find the specific of the copper block. That's our first example, All right? This example involves no um, change of phase. Right? It's just a matter of changing the, uh, changing the temperature through heat exchange. The phase remains the same. Now, we can take a look at, at the second example. This one involves um, phase change. It involves features. So you have a similar setup to that of the previous problem. Um, you have a 25 gram aluminum cup, just like before, but this time it initially contains 50 grams of water and 20 grams of ice in thermal equilibrium. They didn't tell you what the initial temperature is, but it's common, it's common knowledge when water and ice are mixed in thermal equilibrium, which means they do not, they no longer exchange heat with one another, what is the temperature they can coexist? Well, there's only one temperature when water and ice can coexist without thermal, without uh, in thermal equilibrium, without any heat exchange, and that is zero degrees Celsius, right? That's how we define zero degrees Celsius. Okay, that's when the heat, you know, that's when the uh, you know, water undergoes phase change uh, to ice or and vice versa. So the initial temperature is zero degrees. Now we drop a very hot block of aluminum. Okay very hot block of aluminum, 60 grams at 230 degrees Celsius, okay? 230, right? And then we seal the cup. We prevent heat from going in and out of the system. What will be the final temperature inside the cup? Now, you gotta be careful here. Um, you know, this aluminum block certainly is gonna reduce its, uh, its temperature and give up heat. Who absorbs the heat? Well, you say, oh, but there's ice and there's water. Remember, they are both at zero degrees Celsius, right? Um, when heat is being absorbed by the water, it's gonna increase its temperature if, 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 you know, if it's allowed to do that. But in the meantime, what about the ice? The ice is also at zero degrees, right? When it absorbs heat, what happens? Does the temperature change just yet? No, it stays at zero degrees Celsius, except it becomes liquid water, right? But that's zero degree, that's water at zero degrees. The surrounding water temperatures already risen beyond zero degrees if you allow the surrounding water to absorb heat. But that's not gonna happen because, um, you know, the ice is, the, the ice when melted into water remains at zero degrees Celsius. Um, so the first thing that happens when, when heat is being released by the aluminum block is that 
part of the ice will start to melt and become water at zero degrees. Okay, so the, so the water and ice mixture remains at zero degrees for now, except there is more and more liquid water and less and less ice, which is solid form of water. At some point, if there is enough heat released from the aluminum block, then all the water, all the ice will melt into zero degree water. Okay, at that point, if there's still more heat released by the aluminum block, then what's gonna happen? Then all the water which started out at zero degrees Celsius will, what? will heat up to reach a certain final temperature. Okay, and there's even more um, possibility of what happens when even more heat is released by the aluminum block, even when the water, which includes original water plus the, plus the you know, uh, water melted from the ice, if the temperature of, of all this water reaches all the way to 100 degrees Celsius, and there's even more heat has been released by the aluminum block, then what happens is that um, a, a, another phase change will take place, right? This water will now become steam, at least partially become steam, and so on. I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know if there's enough heat released uh, by the, by the um, aluminum block, whether it's enough heat released to, to melt all the ice, to heat up all the water, and even to bring up steam. It depends on how much heat is being released. Now, in order to, um, to, um, to melt the ice, um, it has to release enough energy by lowering its temperature, but a temperature cannot go below zero degrees, right? Because you start with zero degrees as the cold environment. So um, the lowest temperature um, this aluminum block can possibly reach is zero degrees, right? Let's say it release, it goes all the way down to zero degrees. How much heat would be absorbed, uh, would be released by the aluminum block? That would be uh, C aluminum times the mass of the aluminum block, okay? Um, mass of aluminum block, and we call it number three here, one for water, two for the cup, and three for the block. And then the temperature change, that will be all the way from 230 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius, right? Um, two, so, so, so it's, uh, it's T3 initial minus zero degrees Celsius. That is if it, its temperature goes all the way down to zero degrees. And let's see how much that is, okay? Um, that would be, that's Q3. This Q3. Q3 cannot exceed this value because the temperature not, does not necessarily have to go all the way down to zero degrees. Even, even if it did, that is all the heat you can possibly get out of this aluminum block. And so it's less or equal to that. How much is that? Well, point, uh, 125, point 0.215, assuming all the data are known except for the final temperature. So we have to be given the specific heat of aluminum um, calories per gram per Celsius degree times its mass, which is, which is, uh, let's see how much mass is it? 50, 60 grams, uh, 60 grams, okay, 60 grams. Time to temperature change, which is 230 minus zero, right? Celsius degrees, okay? And if you did all this calculation, um, you will get a certain number. Let's see what that number equals to. So that number equals 2,967 calories. Okay, so this is the maximum amount of heat you can possibly get out of this aluminum block by lowering its temperature all the way to zero degrees. In the meantime, um, part of that heat will be used to melt the uh, ice into water. How much heat is necessary to, to melt all the ice into water at zero degrees? Well, that will be the latent heat of fusion of water, the latent heat of fusion for ice times the mass of the ice, right? Okay, mass of the ice. In fact, let me, let me label everything. Uh, so one for ice, two, water, three, uh, the aluminum block, and four, the aluminum cup. Okay, so I have here uh, the amount of heat released, uh, you know, absorbed by the by the ice Q one. 
to, to melt everything. L, L, F, M1. There is no temperature change. It's remains zero degrees. Uh, the latent heat of fusion is 79.7 .7 calories per gram for ice. And then times the mass, which is 20 grams. Okay. And that is 1,594 calories. You notice this is less than Q3. Less than Q3 maximum. Maximum value Q3 is 2,967 calories. So, um, you know, by going all the way down to zero degrees Celsius, the block can release this much calories, this many calories, 2,967, but you only need 1,594 calories to melt all the ice into water. What does that mean? It means the ice, there is enough heat released by the block to melt all the ice. Okay, you're gonna end up with zero degrees ice and water. I mean, sorry, just zero degrees water, no ice anymore, ice is all melted. But it doesn't stop here because there's still some heat left, okay? To bring up the temperature of the zero degree ice, uh, uh, zero degree water into a final temperature while the aluminum block and the aluminum couple settle at the same final temperature. So we now, under, we now know that um, the final temperature is gonna be above zero degrees, okay? Now let's assume that no steam has been produced, which means the final temperature is still under 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, what is the final temperature? <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's see. Heat absorbed equals the heat released. Heat is being absorbed by the ice, the water, and the cup. Okay, so for the ice, first of all, Q1, right? Q1. Plus, um, once the ice melts into water at zero degrees, don't forget you, you ha also have some water that's already there, right? 20, degree, uh, 20 grams of ice turned into water plus 50 grams of water that's already there, the total is 70 grams. So it is uh, mass of the ice M1 plus the mass of the water, which is M2, that's 70, degree, uh, 70 grams times the specific water, because they're both water now, times its temperature change, it goes from T, uh, T initial, which is zero degrees to final temperature, T final, whatever that is, minus zero degrees. So this, the second term is the amount of heat uh, absorbed by the water, which includes the portion that's melted from the ice, from zero degrees to the final temperature, okay? Don't forget there's aluminum cup, which also absorbs heat. It's initial temperature is zero degrees, the final temperature is T final. So we have C aluminum, right? And the mass is uh, M4 right, in our label. And then you have T final minus, again, zero degrees Celsius, T initial. All these three substances will absorb heat, but the only substance that loses heat is the uh, aluminum block. And how much heat does it, does it, does it release? Well, that is, um, C aluminum, uh, C aluminum times the mass of the block, which is M3, right? Times, all right, you wanna keep this positive here. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta take T, um, T3 initial minus T final because T3 initial is 230 degrees Celsius minus T final. That's a positive number, okay? Now, what are we looking for? We're looking for T final. We know everything else, okay? So Q1 is already known, and you know the mass. So, so this, uh, the mass of everything. So let me, let me put some numbers there, put some numbers in there. Okay, so this M1, that is ice, and that is 20 grams. You get M2, which is 50 grams, 50 gram water. And uh, Q1, we already calculated above, and that's 1,400, 1,494 calories, right? And then C aluminum point, Two, one, five, calorie per gram per Celsius degree. Mass of the uh, mass of the aluminum cup, and that is twenty five grams. Okay. See so aluminum same point two one five calorie per gram per Celsius degree. Mass of the block, which is sixty grams. So you know everything else except T final. Okay. You can you can go ahead and solve for T final, and if you do so you get T final 
E equals to 16 degrees, to 216 degrees. Now you notice this is less than 100 degrees Celsius, right? We've assumed the T final to be less than 100 degrees Celsius because we did not count any heat needed to uh, turn water into steam, the latent heat of turning water in into steam. And that comes at an assumption that is the final temperature has got to be under 100 degrees. Otherwise, you know, water is going to stop in turning into steam. And that's not happening here. So our self, our condition, uh, our assumption is correct. There is no heat. Uh, there is no heat of uh, vaporization here because no steam is being produced. If for whatever reason, uh, the final temperature according to this calculation is say 120 degrees, what does that tell you? It tells you our assumption is wrong because the final temperature is already higher than 100 degrees, which means heat, uh, which means um, the water at least has been partially turned into steam. So you have to add another term um, on the left-hand side, which is the heat needed to transform part of the water into steam. Okay, but it's not happening here. So that's, that's an example of calorimetry in, involving phase change or latent heat. You must make a certain assumption uh, you know, whether certain heat, uh, you know, certain phase change has taken place. And of course that happens only when the temperature is either uh, lower than that of the freezing point or higher than of that of, um, um, you know, um, uh, when, when the water turns into steam. So you have to be self-consistent, okay?